spiritual is one of the first American forms of musical expression. It has influenced many genres of contemporary American popular music, especially African American gospel music in subsequent forms, such as rhythm and blues, soul, and pop music. The spiritual reflects and was a result of the outpouring of the hearts of the people who endured over two centuries of enslavement. I am delighted to present these songs and their history to you today. I will lecture for approximately 20 minutes and then sing the first half of the program. I will then lecture for an additional seven to eight minutes and include with the second half of the program. The slave trade period in the United States lasted approximately from 1619 to 1860, when Africans were transported to the New World via slave ships. This period is described as the Middle Passage. In 1619, the first ship arrived carrying Africans and poor Europeans as indentured servants. Originally, indentured servants agreed to work for a landowner in the colonies for a given period of time in exchange for the passage to the New World. At the end of the contract, they were to be free. However, legislation to enslave the African indentured servants for a lifetime was implemented systematically and was written into the colonial courts, one state at a time, state starting in the 1660s. By 1700, all 13 colonies had slavery. Most of the slaves came from the western coast of Africa, spanning 3,400 miles from Senegal to Angola. The Africans were in a strange land, did not speak the language, were torn apart from their customs, their family, their way of life, and were forced into a brutal way of living under the rule of the white colonists. In this harsh environment sprang a uniquely American art form the Negro spiritual. I will now discuss the birth of the Negro spiritual. Music became a link between the different mix of people brought from Africa as slaves in the 17th century. It took over 100 years for the slaves to develop their own religious music, which became known as Negro spirituals. The composition of the spirituals remain a mystery, yet was probably the product of either spontaneous group writing or of a few individuals or adaptations of existing songs. The lyrics were not written down and were performed from memory, thus changes in the texts occurred from singer to singer. In addition to religious songs, other musical expressions were developed by the slaves, such as work songs, field hollers, and borderline songs. The driver who oversaw the slaves' work in the cotton fields, tobacco plantations, and on riverboats encouraged work songs because the singing of such songs created more productivity. The rhythm of the music helped to synchronize their physical movements and also served as a distraction from the torturous labor and blistering heat. Usually a leader would sing with a response from the work gang. Work songs gave the workers an opportunity to express their emotions through music since they were not allowed to verbally communicate their emotions. The work song was also a communal expression because it allowed the slaves to find comfort through expressing their grievances and pain as a group. There were also field hollers, which were shouts, cries, half yodels, or calls by individual slaves working in the fields. According to Arnold Shaw, their purpose was, quote, to communicate messages of all kinds, or to make one's presence known, or simply a form of self-expression, a vocalization of some emotion. Both the work songs and the field hollers were of direct African derivation, not only in the call and response patterns of the former, but in the guttural vocal textures and the sliding tonalities of both the former and the latter, end quote. In addition, slaves were exposed to the music of the European church. In New England, slaves often accompanied their white masters for church services. However, they sat separately but joined in with the other congregants in the singing of psalms and congregational singing. Some spirituals probably evolved from transforming existing psalms, hymns, and popular songs and are called borderline songs. Shaw says these were songs in which the slaves would, quote, 
reassemble special words or phrases of interest into a more satisfactory musical creation by translating these words or phrases into idioms, adding melodic and rhythmic motives which had already been developed and widely used by the slaves, end quote, to create a new original expression of the songs. The Negro spiritual may also have originated as spontaneous creation, as described by J. Miller McKim, quote, who in 1862 asked a slave about the origins of the spiritual and got this response. De Mekomsa, the slave explained further that if something of note occurred during the day, they, the slaves, sang about it that night at the praise meeting. Recognizing the craft and skill involved in this process, the slave asserts, some's very good singers and know how, and they work it in, work it in, you know, till they get it right, and that's the way. Therefore, Negro spirituals were distinctly African American and the result of the slaves' exposure to Christianity and European music and their own African influences and characteristics. There are five African musical characteristics in Negro spirituals that I will discuss. The first is call and response. An example of call and response is in the first Negro spiritual that I sang, Sweet and Low, Sweet Chariot. In call and response, the leader sings a melody line and changing lyrics throughout the song, the call. Swing low, sweet chariot, which is then answered by the response with the repeated melodic line and unchanging lyrics from a group congregation another vocalist or an instrument, in this case, coming forward to carry me home. Coming forward to carry me home. As mentioned, the leader's lyrics change from line to line, while the response lyrics stay the same. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Sounds. 
Sometimes death was the only way the slave could escape his situation. And this was expressed in songs such as Swing Low and Steal Away. Often the lyrics stating a desire for heaven or a better life thereafter were referring to freedom from slavery here and now. The overall message was about being free from bondage, either clearly or implied, and either being free in heaven or on earth. I will now discuss the places where spirituals could be heard. In the African sacred world, there was not a clear distinction between the religious and the secular. Thus, slaves sang spirituals in different settings in addition to the church, such as in camp meetings and during Irene Shout. Just as white congregants had religious revival meetings, African Americans also had their religious gatherings called camp meetings, which were held in the woods, similar to the tribal meetings that were held in Africa. Slaves were not allowed to gather without white supervision, yet many of them risked their safety by convening in their own worship services. In these services, there was often communal singing, praying, and sometimes preaching. As spoken by Miles Mark Fisher, quote, Negroes needed the comfort of group fellowship in order to condition themselves to slave situations. Camp meetings were definite rivals of the African cult, end quote. These meetings were opportunities to express through song their heartfelt emotions regarding the brutality and injustices of slavery. These meetings were often announced through code songs in which the words were substituted with other words to suggest the gathering. The ring shout was a dance derived from an African dance in which the participants would gather in a circle and shuffle their feet, moving around counterclockwise, sometimes for hours until it reached a peak in which the singers would often faint and fall to the ground or drop out. The music starts often with the spiritual and continues for hours and the words become a monotonous shout or cry. Out of the ring shout came the basic patterns and singing style that marked the Negro spiritual, described by Shaw as, quote, coarse vocal textures, propulsive rhythms, heightened emotional level, antiphony of call and response, polyphony of two or more melodies sung simultaneously or overlapping, spontaneous improvisation, and pyramiding repetition. Regarding the dialect, it is important to keep true to the dialect and the spirituals and not make them too straight or correct. The dialect must be treated like a foreign language and not spoken and spoken authentically. The slave created a simplified version of English as he abandoned his native tongue and tried to communicate with his new master. Certain difficult sounds and consonants were changed or left out altogether in an effort to communicate verbally in this new language. Categorizations. There are multiple categories of Negro spirituals by different scholars. The three classifications that I will focus on today are, one, code songs. These songs contain coded or secret messages which were communicated between the slaves and were not intended to be understood by their masters. Two, sorrow songs, which are usually in a slow tempo and describe the pain and torment of life as a slave. Three, jubilee songs, which are up-tempo songs and describe the joy of God, Jesus, and hope for the future. The deep emotional intensity in the spirituals made them unique from white spirituals and hymns being sung at the time. I will now discuss the evolution of the Negro spiritual and its influence on subsequent styles. <clears throat> I will break this into three parts. Choral arrangements, classical solo voice with piano arrangements, and as protest songs. After the Civil War ended, some former slaves began attending universities, such as Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Because the university was in deep financial crisis, a group of 12 singers, named the Fisk Jubilee Singers, went on tour in 1871 to raise money for the university. The group's director, George L. White, 
named the group the Jubilee Singers from the Spiritual, the Day of Jubilee. And the songs they sang were called Jubilee Songs. Initially, the group sang patriotic songs and ballads, which did not prove fruitful. However, Mr. White was greatly moved when he heard some of the students singing spirituals, and he convinced them to sing these songs as part of their program. Initially, the singers, because they were former slaves, were opposed to singing these songs publicly because the songs brought up too many painful memories of a not-so-distant past. <clears throat> However, audiences said that the music and the singers taught them, quote, what is the true refinement of music, end quote. The Fisk Jubilee singers sang choral arrangements of neighbor spirituals and toured the United States and Europe from 1871 to 1878. They raised over $150,000 for the university and exposed the world to the spiritual. Other groups, such as the Hampton students at Hampton Institute in Virginia, followed the Jubilee Singers' lead by going on fundraising tours singing choral settings of the spirituals. In addition to choral settings, solo arrangements of Negro spirituals started being written in the early 1900s by African American composers such as H.T. Burley, James Weldon Johnson, J. Rosamond Johnson, Roland Hayes, Florence Price, and William Grant Still. These arrangements were for solo voice with piano accompaniments, such as the arrangements I am singing here today. And they were sung by African American classical vocalists. Harry T. Burley became the first person to create written arrangements of Negro spirituals for solo voice. He was a solo singer and sang at St. George's Episcopal Church in New York City for 52 years. During this period, he needed new material to present to the congregation. Thus, he began arranging spirituals for solo voice. As explained by the Spirituals Project at the University of Denver, quote, after the turn of the 20th century, a solo concert trad tradition began, beginning with the published piano voice arrangements of composer Harry T. Burley and continuing through the work of many others who followed in Burley's footsteps. This development reached its peak during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 30s, when such noted artists as Roland Hayes, Marian Anderson, and Paul Robeson emerged as nationally prominent concert singers. Eventually, the Negro spiritual was recognized as a genuine American art form. After coming to America to teach at the National Conservatory in New York City in 1892, European composer Dvorak became enthusiastic about the folk music he heard from one of his African-American students, Harry T. Burley. Dvorak saw the uniqueness of the Negro spiritual as an American art form and even used Negro spiritual melodies in his compositions, such as in Symphony No. 5 from the New World. In 1893, Dvorak was quoted in the New York Herald, quote, these beautiful and varied themes are the product of the soil. They are American. They are the folk songs of America, and your composers must turn to them. In the Negro melodies of America, I discover all that is needed for a great and noble school of music." End quote. <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, Marian Anderson and Paul Robeson were two of the first African-American classical vocalists to sing Negro spirituals in their concert programs. Marian Anderson, in 1955, was the first African American to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. However, earlier, in 1939, she was scheduled to sing at a concert at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., but the Daughters of the American Revolution, which oversaw the hall, the DAR, prohibited her from doing so because of a policy which prohibited blacks from performing them. Eleanor Roosevelt stepped in, and the concert was moved to the Lincoln Memorial later that year, with attendance of over 75,000 people. Bass baritone Paul Robeson was the first singer to perform a program of only Negro spirituals. He excelled in many areas, including film, and sang the song Old Man River in the musical Showboat. According to Eileen Southern, quote, Robeson was known as an outspoken critic of racism and oppression in the United States. 
making him an eventual target of the House Un-American Activities Committee during the late 1940s. Unquote. His passport his passport was revoked for eight years, and he no longer received the support of Caucasian audiences, which led him to perform only at African American churches during this period. As spoken by Robeson, quote, as I have said many times, any struggles I have been engaged in, whatever I do, is been that my grandnephews and my grandchildren, that your children, somewhere, we of all races, all creeds, can walk this American earth in unity, end quote. This leads us to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Negro spirituals were used during the civil rights movement as freedom songs, in which the traditional spiritual was sung with some of the lyrics changed to suit the demonstration or protest, or with lyrics directed towards a particular person or organization. As explained by Bernice Regan, quote, the core of freedom song repertoire was formed from the reservoir of traditional songs and older styles of singing. Lyrics were transformed, traditional melodies were adapted, and procedures associated with old forms were blended with new forms to create freedom songs capable of expressing the force and intent of the movement." End quote. Before continuing with the second half of the program, I would like to repeat one last note of importance that I mentioned in the introduction. Many African vocal attributes found in original Negro spirituals have carried forth into contemporary usages and are evident not only in blues and African American gospel music, but also in rhythm and blues, soul, funk, and rock and roll. But that we will do for my dissertation. Yay. <laughs> So I will conclude the lecture portion with a quote by Arnold Shaw. Quote, As an Afro-American fusion, the spiritual was the beginning of the process by which American popular music freed itself from domination by foreign traditions and rooted itself in American soil and the American experience. 